Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Please be seated. Good morning. It's great to see you here this morning. I hope that you are doing well. We're talking about anchor points. <clears throat> and we've talked about the ideas of these things that we need to hold on to in the storms of life. So we've talked about God's sovereignty, that God is in control that he is in control of each and every circumstance, and that there's never a time in our lives where God is going to say, oh, wait a minute, I didn't see that coming. He always knows what is going to happen because he is in control, because he is ruler. We also talked about the other anchor point, and that is God's infinite wisdom, that God has such limitless wisdom that he knows what is best for you in each and every circumstance. And he knows the best way to bring about that good result. That's his infinite wisdom. And so we need to securely grab hold to anchor ourselves to these points, especially when the storms of life come against us. But there are the times when we are facing adversity. And maybe when we are holding on to those anchor points, that our minds begin to start to think. Our finite logic wants to comprehend the infinite God. And so as we're holding on to these things, our minds start to start turning. You can see the hamster wheel just spinning in our minds going, well, wait a minute. If I'm in this adversity and God can control adversity and he can do something about it, why isn't he doing something about my circumstance? And not only that, not only are we facing then the doubts that come in the midst of an adversity. But then it is those times when Satan comes up to us and he whispers so quietly in our ear, if he loved you, he wouldn't let this happen. And that's where we need that third anchor point that is the idea of God's unfailing love. That which steadies our minds and our hearts in the storms of life. As we think about God's love, just as we see with God's sovereignty and with his wisdom, it is just about on every page of his word. So it is with his love. We see in Psalm 100 and verse 5, it says, For Yahweh is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. In Psalm 107 and verse 1, it says, Oh, give thanks to Yahweh, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. The idea that his love has no beginning and no ending. It is continual. That is who he is. And John tells us in 1 John 4 and verse 8 that God is love. And when he's saying that, he's not just saying that God gives love, but that he is the very source of love. That that is his very nature. That just as he is perfectly holy, 
he is also perfect love. And that he is continually seeking what is best for others. That in his love, God shows kindness. He gives mercy. He promotes justice. And he seeks what is good continually. And because God is love, it is an essential part of his nature to do good and show mercy to his creation. Notice what the psalmist says in Psalm 145, beginning verse 7. It says, They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Yahweh is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Yahweh is good to all. And his mercy is over all that he has. Yahweh is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. In everything that God does, he pours out his love. There's never a moment where he says, oh, I'm going to pull that back. He is continually, that's who he is, that is his nature. He pours that out on all of his creation, that he is good, and therefore he is love. And so to doubt God's goodness, to doubt his love, is to doubt who God is. It's like just in the same way we, we might say, well, I don't know if there's really such thing as, a, as gravity. Well, all of us, it doesn't matter. I mean, gravity is. That, it, it's just, it's there whether we believe it or not. That's, that's, who, that's what it is. God is saying, I am love. And, and when we begin to doubt, we begin to deny who he is. Philip Hughes said it this way. To question the goodness of God is, in essence, to imply that man is more concerned about goodness than God. To suggest that man is kinder than God is to subvert the very nature of God. It is to deny God. And this is precisely the thrust of the temptation to question the goodness of God. That's what Satan wants us to do. He wants us to doubt, does God really love me? But his love is continual. His love is constant. And so the real matter is not questioning God's love. But it is fighting the doubts that are within us. Fighting the emotions that try to tell us that God is not. So it's a matter of knowing God's love. But as with everything for us, we say, well, wait a minute. How can I know God loves me? It's a matter of I need to see action. And God demonstrates his love for us by meeting our greatest need. By saving us from sin. And the extent of that love is seen not only in the cost of our salvation, but also in our condition. Notice what John says in 1 John 4 verse 9. He says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. Our greatest need, period, was that we needed to be saved from eternal separation from God. That's what our sin caused. That's what it brought about. And God recognized that and he says, I am going to do something about it. I love you so much that I am going to send my only son. He's going to leave glory. 
as we're told in Philippians 2. It's going to leave the beauty of heaven and it's going to come to earth and he's going to put on flesh. That means he became finite. He had to walk from point A to point B rather than saying, hey, I'm at point A and point B at once. As he put on flesh, he lived like you and me. He, he got splinters in his, ar- 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 in his hands as he was working with wood. He got tired. He got hungry because that's who we are. And then he willingly gave himself to die on a cross for you and me. And that's not just the physical pain of the cross. It is the emotional and it is the spiritual that he experienced separation from God on our behalf. Try to put this into my own thinking to grasp even a a handful of what that really meant. I try to think, could I give my only son Grant for all of you. I'd like to say yes. But then he's my son. The one that I love. The one that he, he is. He's, he's so much like me. Then, And if he didn't do anything. Why would I give him for you? But there in his love. Would I love you that much to give my son for you? And God says overwhelmingly, yes, I love you that much. Let me show that to you. But not only is it the cost that we can see his love for us, it is our condition. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 it says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Think about our condition. You might do something for someone who is your friend. But I would say very rarely do we ever do something that is of benefit to someone who is our enemy. We really struggle with that. But notice what it says here. When we were enemies of God, when we were serving Satan, when we were living for our passions, our pleasures, when we were such that everything that we were doing made us an object of God's wrath, that's when God sent his son for us. You know, God didn't wait. He didn't say, well, let me see. If you get a little bit better, if you start trying to do some things on your own, then I'll come, then I'll help you. That's not when he came. He came when we were completely hostile to him, our creator. He said, this is how much I love you. That in spite of what you are doing against me, I want to save you. God did that. If he did all of that because he loves us, then he will give us all things. That's exactly what Paul makes the argument about in Romans 8 and verse 32 when he says, He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Paul is arguing here from the greater to the lesser. He's saying if God did the greatest thing of all, if he did that, then he's able to do everything else. I've used this illustration before. Hopefully it it makes sense to you. Let's say that I have the ability, I really don't, but let's just say that I have the ability to give everybody in this auditorium a million dollar house. I'm going to take care of your needs. I'm going to give you the house of of your dreams. and I'm going to give that to you. If I could do that. And then if you needed a toothbrush, 
don't you think that I could go to Dollar Tree and get you a toothbrush? Yeah. That's what Paul's saying here. God met your ultimate need. He saved you from being separated from him from all eternity. And if he could do that, then whatever you need today, he can give it to you because he loves you. And notice that God's love for us cannot fail. Oftentimes we are tempted to look within ourselves for the reasons why God should love us. And if we look too long, what happens is we find not, not reasons why God should love us, we find reasons why God should not love us. But that's not how God operates. God's love is not based on what we do, but who we are, that we are his children in Jesus Christ. You see, being in Christ means that we are in union with the one that God loves. And God's love to us can no more waver than his love for his son. It just won't happen. That's exactly what we saw in our reading this morning. What can separate us from the love of, of God in Christ Jesus? And he goes through and he says, nothing can separate you. I like how Jerry Bridges says it. He says, he, that is our father, loves us because we are in Christ Jesus. When he looks at us, he does not look at us as standalone Christians, resplendent in our own good works, even good works as Christians. Rather, he looks at us. He sees us united to his beloved son, clothed in his righteousness. He loves us not because we are lovely in ourselves, but because we are in Christ. That's the blessing that you and I have. Is it because of our union with Jesus, God always loves us? And so we say, okay. If I understand that mentally, intellectually, how does that help me in my adversity? Let me give you just three things that I think God's love can do. It can do so much more, but just three things for today. Number one is that we learn to live in God's promises. And to sort of understand that a little bit better, to set that up, I want us to, to look at Isaiah 54, verse 8 beginning. There it says, In overflowing anger, for a moment I hid my face from you. But with everlasting love, I have compassion on you, says Yahweh, your Redeemer. This is like the days of Noah to me, as I swore that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth. So I have sworn that I will not be angry with you and will not rebuke you. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you. And my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says Yahweh, who has compassion on you. I want you to think about the Israelites as they are reading what Isaiah wrote and they're in the midst of exile. Their land is taken from them. They're, they're seemingly their identity. They don't know who they are anymore. They're, they're just subservient to this Babylonian king. And then you read what God says here. He says, I've always had compassion for you, and it is not going to fail. God is faithful. And what he says, he will do. And he gave us, us a covenant of peace. He established that through his son. He says, 
He died so that you can come into relationship with me. And his love, his active good will for us never fails. We need to understand that. Because there are going to be times in our lives where we will face things like what we see in Lamentations 3. Really, verses 1 through 20 are all of this calamity and adversity that that is being experienced by the writer. And and he then comes to verse 19 and he says, I remember my afflictions and my wondering, the bitterness and the gall. I I well remember, remember them. And my soul is downcast within me. I would say at this moment, the writer is at the bottom. Emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And he's saying, I remember the pain that I endured. I'm going through it right now. But something changes. In verse 21, but this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of Yahweh never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Do you see that verse 21 changed everything? Because instead of looking at his circumstances, now he focuses on God. He remembers who God is. He says, I remember that you're faithful. I remember what you do continually. He is reminded that no matter how bad things are, God continues to give mercies. No matter what you're facing right now, you've been blessed with a new day today. The sun came up. Maybe this morning early, it might have been, well, the clouds are still there. Yeah, but, the, but you are able to see because of the light of the sun. And God is, is there and he's saying, I am giving you mercies, mercies that you may not even see or understand today, but they are new for you today. To help you get through this day. You see so many times. We look to see God's love through our circumstances. But instead we must see our circumstances through God's love. You see a lot of times we're faced with these difficulties and these problems in our lives. And what we do is we then begin to look around and we say. Where is God in all of this? We need to turn that around. We need to start with the idea that God loves me. And because his love does not fail, then what that means is that he will only allow the pain and heartache in our lives that is for our ultimate good. He's never going to give you more than you can handle. Now, that's hard for us sometimes because you're like, Lord, I don't know that I can handle this. You may think that I can, but I don't know that I can handle it. God says, you can with my help. So whatever you're going through today, it is not because God is saying, I don't love you. God has, has orchestrated your whole life and he is showing through every step that he loves you and he's only going to give you whatever pain and difficulties so that you come to the ultimate good. And that brings us to the second point. That he loves us so much that he disciplines us. Last week as we were looking at God's infinite wisdom, we looked at Hebrews chapter 12. And it talks about the discipline of God that it is, it is for bringing us into his holiness. But notice here, as we said last week, 
that discipline is not for punishment. God does not discipline us to punish us because Christ took that punishment on the cross. One time for all time. And so the discipline that we go through is to transform us into the image of His Son. It says there in verse 5 of Hebrews 12, And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by Him, for the Lord disciplines the ones He loves. And He chastises every son whom He receives. It is only because God wants us to grow into the image of His Son that He brings discipline into our lives. Think about it. If we never suffered, we would never grow. It would always be just status quo. But it is when we face adversity, it is when we are tried to say, wait a minute, where is my faith? Is it in something else? Is it in man? Is it in this world? Or is it in God? That's when we see what we are made of. And that's why God disciplines us. But here is the last point that I want you to see. That God goes with us through our adversities. In Isaiah 43 in verse 2, there God says through Isaiah, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. I want you to see that our Father is not withdrawn from our circumstances. We don't serve a God who just sort of says, oh yeah, 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 you're going through some trials, okay, well let me send my, you know, some strength from heaven, and you let me know when it's over with, and we'll see how it all comes out. That's not how God operates. Look at what he says here in this verse. When you pass through the waters, when the worst thing in life is coming at you, God says, I will be with you. That's the kind of God we serve. I have this image in my mind of somebody who's gone through great trauma with their legs and now they're trying to walk again. And what they're doing, the only way that they can do it is with an arm around their rehab specialist. And they're relying upon the strength of that person to be able to walk. That's God in each and every one of our circumstances. He's not distant to it. He's saying, I'm right there with you to go through what you're going through because I've already experienced it and I know how to help you. So he is not a God who is distant, but a God who is there in all of your hurt. And in all of your pain, he's right beside you. I'll end with this quote. God's unfailing love for us is an objective fact affirmed over and over in the scriptures. It is true whether we believe it or not. Our doubts do not destroy God's love, nor does our faith create it. It originates in the very nature of God, who is love. And it flows to us through our union with his beloved son. But the experience of that love and the comfort it is intended to bring is dependent upon our believing the truth about God's love as it is revealed to us in the scriptures. Doubts about God's love allowed to harbor in our hearts will surely deprive us of the comfort of his love. God loves you. That will never change. That is a constant that you can hold on to in your life. 
And he knows what you are going through because he is right beside you through your trial. And he has a plan for you. He says, if you will trust my sovereignty, if you will trust my wisdom, and if you will trust my love, I will bring you through whatever it is that you are in the midst of right now. And on the other side, you will be closer to your Father. And you will look more and more like Jesus Christ. That's what He wants for you this morning. Have you started your journey with Him through baptism? Through repenting of your sins, saying, I want to serve you, God, and you alone. I give up, I renounce everything else, but you are my Lord. Make me your child through the grave of baptism. Maybe this morning you're struggling. Maybe you've got something that is just so weighing you down that you just need to talk to somebody. Our shepherds are here. As I continually say, we are not perfect people. We are broken people. And it is only by God's grace that we can take the next step. It is only by being together as a group of his people that we can go forward. So if you just need prayers, whatever it is that you need, that invitation is open to you. Won't you come? As together we stand and sing.